All right. This is too trivial. If x1 is equal to m2, you know how to do that. Only thing you got to remember in this language is you got to put the parentheses around it for all the Python people who are used to not doing so. If x is greater than or equal to that number, just a. You have to start pulling that on me again. All right. Why you do that? Just make sure you make it. You know, if I ask greater than or equal to, make sure you get the uh, equal to as well. Right. You know. I would give you some credit for that. Partial credit, maybe a majority credit, but you get total credit if you have equal sign. If x1 is not equal to m2, and of course there's more than you know, would you more than one way to write that, right? You could do this one. If not x1 equals equals m2, that's one way to do it. What's more likely? If what should I put here? Cleaner syntax. If x1 is not equal to m2. Yeah, not equal to like that. Right? That's better. If x is equal to y and y is less than z. So we just need to remember the and operator. What's the and operator? Two ampersands. Yep, two ampersands. Right. What's the or operator? Keep straight bar. Yep. All right. If both operands have to be true for the result to be true, is that an and or an or? Both of them have to be true for the result to be true. It's going to be an and. So that's going to be an and. Everybody agree? Yep, I see some nodding heads. Yep, good, good, good. All right. But if it takes either or, there's a word that gives it away. If only one of them has to be true, then that's an or. What will be displayed? Well, this is a simple if statement. Is x greater than y or y is equal to 2? Well, we know this is true. That part's true. Already, since it's an or, I know that z is going to be 4. I don't even have to check this one out. That one's not true, but since this one was, all right. A greater than B and C is equal to 3. Well, C is equal to 3. That part's true, but they both have to be true because it's an and. Is A greater than B? No. 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 So C is not going to change to 4. It's still going to be 3. All right, these are stupid qu questions, right? But according to the book, when would you use a for loop? I love this one if either of the other two reasons fit. But... When the code will iterate through a range of sequential values. That's perfect for for loops. Yeah, you could write the same thing with a while loop. Because there's nothing you can write with a while loop that can't be done with a for loop and vice versa. It's just that the for loop has a nice syntax for it. So, if it's going to iterate through a range of sequential values, use a for loop. If the code in the body of the loop has to be performed at least once, what kind of loop are you going to use? Not do, for loop. Do while. You're going to use a do, right? Because do has the words do, and then it's got some code in the body. There's no way for it to not execute that code in the body, right? There wasn't an if statement or a while or a for in front of it. Which is the next one? When do you use a do loop? When the code of the body of the loop needs to be performed at least one time. And then you use a while loop if neither of the other two reasons fit. Now, some languages, like Python, don't even have a do loop, so obviously it's not an absolute necessity in the programming world. You know, back in the old days, before these nice languages, you just had if jump statements. You know, and you wrote all your loops like that. You probably still do in, in a lot of languages. It's just that Java forbids that. The go-to statement is there, but it's... Uh, causes a syntax error. All right. How many times is this going to print hello? You just have to count it out. It's going to go from 2 up to, but not 6, increasing by 1. So 2, 3, 4, 5, not 6. So how many times is it going to print it? 4. four times. Yeah. Now how many times is it going to print? Going 
going from zero to less than or equal to five? Over in the six times. It's going to be six times, right? You could count it out. In general, now nah, I'm not going to even say in general. You know how to do this stuff. Write a for loop that'll go from one to eight. Just make sure that you don't do less than eight. It's going to be less than or equal eight, right? Because you want it to get to eight. Or you can do less than nine. Yeah. Well, x is less than nine. That works. Or x is less than or equal to eight. Both of those work. How about this one? Same deal. Make sure it's less than or equal to 10. And since it's going by twos, and there's more than one way to do this. Some, um, some people, right. But anyways, you know, 4 and w equals what? Where am I starting? Two. Yeah. W is going to be what? What's my condition? Less than, Less than or equal to 10. Yep, and then how much am I going to increment it by? 2. W plus equals two. Yep. Now what will this print? X is equal to two. Do a switch on X. It's going to jump to case two. It jumps to two. It prints B and it breaks. So that's all it's going to do. It's going to print B. Now what is it going to do? X is equal to two. Switch X. It's going to jump to case two. It prints a B, but there's no break statement. So what does it do? everything else floater. until it finds another break yep it falls through so it's going to print b it's going to print c there's no break statement so it's even going to print d all right index of e it's going to search the string for the position of e so what is the index value of that e Yep, because that's zero. So that's one. All righty. Now what's it going to return? There is no E in it. So we'll bring minus one. Yep, minus one. Pretty much all search functions work like that. Sometimes they return a value that is negative, but not equal to negative one. So you just check to see if it's less than zero. That works pretty much universally in all search functions for all data types strings or arrays or whatever. All righty, one divided by two. So at this point, x is equal to what? What's one divided by two? They're both floats, so no rounding down is going to happen. 0.5. So 0 0.5, and then what does the floor do? Flo Zero. Floor. Two. Zero. Yeah, rounds it down. Even if it was 0 0.999, when you say floor, it rounds it down. And seal, like ceiling, would round it up. Just like that. All right, so we have 0 0.5. Taking the ceiling of that cranks it up to 1. x to the power of 2, well, 4 to the power of 2. 4 times 4. 16. 16. So write a single line of code that uses the double class to parse a string and store the result. So what's the name, variable name that's going to hold our result? So we read our sentence. Yep, it's D. So D is equal to. So double dot. We're going to use the double class. Then parse double. I know you're thinking of another language. Yeah. Uh, parse double, and then the variable that we are parsing is S. Which language I don't know, but asking the string to turn to return an integer is not an unreasonable thing in my mind that they didn't make it do that. Okay, so substring two comma four. Now honestly, I don't remember, I think I remember, whether this is the length of the string that is supposed to return or whether it goes from two up to and not including. It's a ladder. Four. Okay, so it's a ladder. Yeah. I just hit an, a, a language recently that this specified the length of the characters and that was moronic. Okay, so this is going to be starting at index 2 and going up to but not including 4. The way I think of it is I just take the difference. 4 minus 2, that's going to be the length of it. So starting at 2 and then giving me two characters, that's 0, that's 1, that's 2, so it's going to be LL. What's 
What's the return type? Yeah, right. What's the parameter type? That just makes sure that you know the difference between a return type and a parameter type. What's the keyword that means it doesn't return anything? Void. Void. Write a formatted print statement. It's going to be a floating point. So forgetting the system.out, printf. Okay, so it's a floating point. How do I specify that we're doing a placeholder in this language? Percent. And it's going to be a float, so f, but it needs to fill 10 characters on the screen, so I can't just leave it at percent f. What do I have to do? Percent 10. Percent 10, and it needs two places after the decimal point. How do I specify that? 10.3. Yep, yep, yep. Same as in C, same as in Python. Nice. Okay. Is it the same as C++? Correct. No. Yes. <laughs> um, if you remember in C++, we used the IO manipulator class because we were using streams. However, C++ does have the old C print F command, which you can use interchangeably. We just did it the C++ way. All righty. Here's another print F. It's an integer type, so what's our percent going to be? I wish it was percent I, but it's not. Percent D. Percent D. So print F, percent D, and it's going to be five characters wide, so we stick a five there. All right, submit our quiz. We're done. Like I said, when we say chapters five through nine, it sounds like a lot, but that stuff is pretty much really easy for y'all. ask him to uh, that professor to type for me he's got enough voice for both of us <laughs> uh, all righty a couple of times we've defined a class a few times as being a collection of what with what that act upon it Meth objects with methods yeah it's a collection of data yeah, and you could word that a couple of different ways. It's a collection of variables, it's a collection of data, it's a collection of objects, uh, whatever. It's a collection of data with what that act on it. Methods, right. Now, uh, strictly, strictly, strictly speaking, a class is not that. That's the definition of an object, and a class is the blueprint for a collection of data, but we get that. Does a class have to have data? No. Does a class have to have object um, methods? No. Nah. You could leave them both out, but then it'd be stupid. All right. Data private makes yeah. public. So let, let's just make some up. Data private's a good one. What methods else? Public. Methods public. What's a couple others? Constructors when it makes sense. Constructors. Getters. When it makes it easy, yeah, getters and setters, which you could list as two, you know, to, to pad it out to five, <laughs> which are more technically known as accessors and mutators. If you wanted another one, class, ah, class names capitalized. If you wanted yet another one, Add a two string method to convert the data to string for easy printing. Yeah, there's kind of like six or seven. If you can think of other ones, feel free. All right, if it's got the static key, what? If it's got the static keyword, does that make it a class variable or an instance variable?
Now, who knows and they're just remaining silent? Give your hand if you know and you're just remaining silent. Come on, guys. Class boot. Ant I. Static ant X. When we make a boot, and I do that, that works. The compiler doesn't flag it as suspicious. Does that make that an instance variable or a class variable? What is B is an instance of that class. So B is an instance of the class. So I is an instance variable. If I want to get a hold of this static one, I have to use a class name. Might be able to use the instance name. Some compilers would uh, flag that as an error. Others would flag it as a warning. So boo.x is equal to 10. So what's in front of the x now? A class or an instance? That's a class. So that makes x a class variable. Now, did that answer the question? No. But you got to remember that if it's got the static keyword, that makes it a class variable. which makes the other ones instance variables for instance members because you can do the same thing with functions, with methods. So, static equals class. <laughs> Non-static equals Febreze wipes that you put in your laundry. No, non-static equals instance variables. Is an object an instance of a class, or a class an instance of an object? An object an instance of a class. Right. We're all pretty clear on that. I hope you. In class, I sometimes call them client classes. The book calls them driver class. I also use the term data class, which the book calls the driven class. Which of the statements is true? Your main method goes in what? Does it go in the driver class, the client class, or in the driven class? Driver. Yeah, it goes in the driver. If you want to be weird, you can put a main method in your data class. But then your static main has to call, has to create that. Okay, just for giggles. I, I shouldn't do this. Yeah, I'm not going to do it. Right. Yeah, I am. Normally we see this, static void, main, right, and then blah, blah, blah. You could do this. Boo b is equal to new boo. And then boo.main. And that would let you call a non-static main. Right? So you could make this class drive itself. Forget that. The book mentions it. That's the only reason I'm talking about it. I consider that kind of non-standard behavior. But, now nah, I won't even do the buts. All right. Instance variables are part of the class, or instance variables are defined in methods in the class? Instance variables are all required outside. Right, because what are the ones that are defined in methods called? Well, they're not global variables, if you've heard that term. If they're defined in a method or a function, they are local. local. Right, exactly. Okay, that's what I was getting confused. So. Instance versus local. So, instance variables are defined as part of the class. Variables declared in methods are local variables. A UML diagram provides an outline of the class. The above is definitely true. true. Please answer A. Wait, which quiz are we on? I can't see. It is quiz. Chapter 6, I believe. 
All right. Regarding UML, the top block is what? It, it, it would be the class name. Yep. What's the middle section? And then the last, well, the methods go at the bottom. If you put a minus sign in front of something, what does it mean? That it's private or that it's static or public? Private. Minus sign means private. Plus sign or leaving it out means that it's public. I don't even know how you specify that something is a static variable. In, in italics or something? I don't remember. That's why I'm not going to ask you. Plus sign means public. A getter is which? An accessor or a mutator? Well, you're getting data, which means you are accessing, accessing it. So that means that the setter is mutating it. It's changing it. All right. Which one of these is an int? Zero. Oh. Better question. What is the default value of an int? Zero. 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 Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was going for one and two. Right. Uh, you need to be careful. I've gotten into situations where people will say one is the answer, and so they choose one when they should have chosen two. In this case, I think it's okay. But anyways, Boolean. What's the default value for a Boolean? Some people have chosen true in the past, but it's not. Right? Zero, false. And so a string, the default value of a string is not empty quotes. And if I put empty quotes then that would not be the right answer. It's just another zero, which is null. No. All right. Halfway through. Go voice. Keep going. Seven. More about object-oriented programming. We're going to talk about constructors. So, what is true about constructors? Is this the one that says they're all true? Yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> Definition. A constructor is a method that has the same name as the class, comma, no return type, and is called when the object is instantiated by the new keyword. So, if I ask you, written, you know, in sentence form to write what a constructor is. You don't have to hit your book for a definition. I'd rather you say a constructor is a method that has the same name as the class itself, no return type, and that is called when the object is instantiated by the new keyword, or in short, is called by the new keyword. Can the constructor assign values? Oh, sure, of course. Any method can assign values. Can a class have more than one constructor? Is that true or false? It can as long as the uh, parameters are different. Yeah, the parameter lists have to be different. You could have a constructor that accepts one int, a constructor that accepts two ints, and a constructor that accepts no ints. So, yep. That's true. Can you define a constructor with no parameters? Sure. That just replaces the default constructor. If you have a parameterized constructor, then that gets rid of the default constructor, and you have to go back in and add one if you need it. I don't have that as a question, but that's worth mentioning. You add a parameterized constructor. Java no longer provides the default, no parameter constructor. So add one if you need it. <clears throat> you may not need it. That scanner has to have something between it, so they didn't put a default constructor in it. Generally, we define constructors to be public. True. Yeah, that's true. Otherwise, it couldn't create. A private constructor is a little bit I used then. <laughs> yeah. You could make some code that depended upon a private constructor, but I'm not going to even demonstrate why. Okay, say you have this class. What would a constructor look like that would accept two arguments? We need to write a constructor that will accept something that will create height and width. So, does this one look like a good constructor? I hate it when the answer is the, the correct answer is the first one. So instead, let's start asking what's wrong with it. What's wrong with this one as being a constructor? Private. It's private and 
Morals are static, it. right? A constructor should create an instance, so you would not make static because static may call class. I wish there was a different keyword than static. I know why they chose static. Public static but, void. Yeah. So public is good, but calling it static and void, yeah, you don't put a return type. And that uh, doesn't have any arguments. That and doesn't have any arguments. The last so that's one wrong. Is also public. And last one is also private. Yep. 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 Okay. Well, we could theoretically use the e for perhaps something. It would. Yeah. I'm going to give y'all an example of a private constructor that would work. We had our boo class up here. We're going to make a private boo that takes a string, and it should have been capitalized. Does something with that string. And then we're going to make a public foo that takes an integer. And for some reason, it calls foo. Or it may, it, 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 forget it. Forget it. Technically, you could get it to work. I, I've never seen fit to do that myself. This is true. You use the this keyword to access instance members. This dot x equals whatever. Yeah, that's true. That's the correct syntax. On the other hand, you use the this keyword access static members. Even if the compiler accepts it, that shouldn't you shouldn't do it. What's wrong with it, however? C plus plus will just go ahead and, and gleefully do it. Java, I believe, flags it either as a warning or an error. And the reason why is because you want the thing in front of the variable to either be a class or an instance, depending upon whether it's a class or an instance. Because here in our boo class, if we did uh, b.x equals 10, then I would just assume, looking at this code, that this was an instance variable. And C++ being the loosey-goosey kind of thing it is, it'll let you do that. Java either flags it as a warning or an error because this is useful information, whatever is in front of it. If it starts at a capital letter, you know it's a class variable. If it starts at a lowercase letter and it looks like your instance, you know it's an instance variable, and they enforce that. All right, so we want to create a circle. Everybody knows how to do this, but we're going to do it anyways. The class is called circle. I want to create an object named C1. So what am I going to do to create a circle? Yep, because I have to declare it. I can't just do C1 is equal to new circle. If I say declare, you have to give it the data type. If you did that, I'd give you like half credit. I'm not going to be a jerk. Circle C1 is equal to new. I should make this entirely multiple choice, right? And then I can't be a jerk. I just wouldn't even check it. I'm kidding. All right, circle C1 equals new circle. Don't forget the uh, braces. I sure would like for you to put the semicolon so the auto grader will, will grade it correctly. Do we put anything inside the parentheses? No. No, because we're doing the default constructor. Here we have a constructor. It's going to be the same line of code, but we need to provide some data. So circle C1 is equal to new circle, but... In here, we want to set the radius to 10, so we're going to pass 10 into it. Write a method that will calculate the... I'm going to just do this in Notepad. Calculate the area of the circle and return it. So the method should be called getArea, should be public, Declared with return type double, except no parameters. Well, let's do that part first. We don't have to write the whole class. I just ask you to write the method. So it's public. Is it going to be static? No, because it applies to an instance, and I don't tell you otherwise. Don't put static unless I actually say class. I'm not going to. All right. What's its return type? If we remember, it was double. What's the name of it? Get area. Does it have parameters? No, except no parameters. And what's it supposed to do? Return something, and there's the function. So you could do this in two statements or one, right? 
we could just return that. Or we could do this and then return it. Right, so double area is equal to that. Formula return area. And then we're good to go. So when you pass a reference to a method, you enable that method to modify the referenced object. Well, I say it's true, but what does that mean? That means that if I create some code that's going to pass boo to something, like somewhere else I have some function, you know, public void do something, and it takes a boo, and then I say b.x is equal to 20, is that valid? If, if I call do something with, with, with a boo object, is that valid? Yes, it is. Is it going to change x to 20? Yes, it is. When you pass a reference type to a function, to a method, you're allowed to change the values of the instance members. Can you change b itself? Can you do this? And the answer is no. b is equal to new. Boo. Like that. That won't work. Just like if you have a function like this. Void, do, you know, and you pass in i, and then in here you say i is equal to 100. And then you call do. Is that going to magically somehow change the universal definition of 10 to 100? It's from ever more 10 to equal 100? No. So if you created a variable, would it come back always equaling 100? No, only if it was equal to b 100 when it came in. So primitive data types, you can change them inside the function, but it doesn't affect them. It doesn't affect the argument. Reference types. Yes, you can change the instance members of it, but you can't change it itself. You can't create a new object and assign it. If you want to do that, just return that thing, right? <coughs> return. That would work. You'd have to change the type. <coughs> you can have more than one method. Yes, as long as the parameter lists are, the same, are different. And it's called overload. True or false? I hope everybody will answer true, but I'm not going to count you off if you say false. All right, lastly, arrays. Who's that lastly? Yep. Yeah. Skip date, which was called software engineering. Worth reading. I'm not going to lecture. All right, which of the following statements are true? Arrays are declared with square braces. Yeah. yeah. If it's an array of ints, can you put strings or doubles in it? No. Somebody argued with me that you could store different data types if you made them all strings. And I got what they meant. Yes, you could put a, a version of an int inside a string. And you could put a version of a you know, float inside a string. But could you put a version of a boo in a string? Yeah, technically you could, but it would be an awful lot of work. No, an array should be all objects of the same type which makes that true as well. An array is a variable that can store multiple values of the same type. Now, when you say an array is a variable, people kind of think of it as like being a series of variables. But it's really just one variable, right? Student, parentheses one, student, parentheses zero, student, parentheses two. So it's a single variable. And once you allocate it, its size will grow and shrink? Nope, we've talked about that. There's a different data type called an array list that does that, and we will use that again. That'll be the next lecture. Write a line of code that'll declare an array of type int. Okay, so int, then what? It's going to be an array, so what do I do? I have to do the brackets, and you poor C++ guys have to not put the brackets there, but fortunately, you've already taken that exam. Just remember, 
And then what's the array called? Test. Yeah. I will have sympathy if to invents it right or like that, but that's not correct in the language. Do that? Yeah, so you can only do that in C, C++. Now we're going to write one that allocated to a length of five elements. You could do this. I would not count you wrong if you did this, and then you set, and then you put in five elements, right? Those should all be commas. But what if I said 5,000, right? So anyways, use the new keyword. So int square test is equal to what? New, new int, int. brackets five. Yeah. And now use an initializer list. Same kind of business. String colors is equal to, and inside the curly braces, but then we have to put the quotes. You could just copy and paste that. Don't forget the semicolon so that I have to go back and fix the auto grader. All right, is this an array of five elements? Sure is. One, two, three, four, five. What's the first element's number? Zero. Yeah, zero. We don't even have to think very hard about that. The first element of an array is index zero. And so the last one, if it's 10, it nine. It's nine. 9, because 0 through 9 is equal to 10. Count it out if you need to. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. <clears throat> if you need the length of an array, which of these will work without you going and having to write additional functions? Because, yes, you could write this as a function, but not writing it as a okay. And do we put parentheses or not parentheses? No. No parentheses. You put parentheses if it's string, no parentheses if it's an array, and they came out with some cute little mnemonic that I never can remember. So just remember, if it's a string, put parentheses. How should we print the array? The array is called IA, and there's two ways of doing it. There's going to be a for each, and then there's going to be an index-based loop. Does this look good? For every int, for each int x in IA, print x. Does that one look like a good idea? No. I think it's a good idea. I think that that's a good for each loop for printing it out. So for every x in the array, print out x. I think that's good. How about this one? For every x in the array, print out array element subscript x. The only time that would work is if the data was equal to 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Otherwise, you, you, you're surely going to get indexing errors. So that's not good. How about this? We're going to print out ia subscript i. I think that's good, right? Because we're going out to num. Yes, num is valid. <clears throat> so what's wrong with this one? We've already established that that one's good. What's wrong with D? It just prints out the indices so and not the values. Yeah, it's going to print out 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. How about that one? What's wrong with that one? It wants to print the whole thing, not the individual. Right. It's just going to print out a memory address in this particular language. And the local F. Same thing there. It's just going to print out the memory address. Three of these are true. Can parallel arrays be of different types? Well, what's the definition of a parallel array? Two or more arrays of the same length where the elements of the array are linked by their index number. Does that make any mention of type? No. No. So they can be, right? You can do strings and ints. You know? Social security numbers and birth dates, right? So parallel arrays should be of different lengths. No, nope. that's definitely not true. When I say three are true, oh, this one is true. Okay, that means that the other two are true. But let's look at them. To use parallel arrays, elements of the same subscript are related. 
right? Car zero, color zero. They should link. Parallel arrays are two or more arrays that contain related data. Yep, just by definition. If it is unknown how much data an array will hold, you will wind up, you may wind up with a partially filled array. Partially filled is where you're not guaranteed that the whole thing is full of good data. So, which of these are true? Should you make the array large enough to hold the largest expected number of elements? Yes. Yeah. Now, don't be ridiculous. If you're counting number of students in a class, do you need to declare an array that's 7,000 elements long? Not unless you're going to have a class that's incredibly large. So that's true. All right. Use a counter variable to keep track of the elements. I give it away right there. But yeah. Otherwise, how do you know when to stop, right? If it's a, an array of 100, but only the first 10 are true, 10 are valid, you have to have a counter to indicate that those are good values. And this makes C false. Then. Make C false, but let's look at it. You should process the array from beginning to end, ignoring the counter. No, because the rest of them are going to be null or zero or something like that. They're going to be some kind of default value. Lots of people, if I hadn't put that, and I'm not going to on the exam, they will say use equal equal to compare arrays. No, you cannot use equal equal to compare arrays. You cannot use equal equal to compare strings either in this language. C++ is different because all that that is doing is comparing memory addresses. If both arrays point to the same memory address, yeah, equal equal will work. But how often do you have two different arrays that are sharing the same memory? Not ever, hopefully. A nested loop is not a valid way to access. OK, is a nested loop a good way of accessing the yes. data in a two-dimensional? Yeah, so I'm not makes that false. To compare that's true. To compare them, you got to go element by element. Right? You have two lists. Just like you had two grocery lists and you were comparing them. You checked the first one and the first one and the second one and the second one until you found one that was different. All right. If it's four by three, is it going to have 12 elements or seven elements? Twelve. Twelve. Because it's multiplied. That's what the by means, four by three. Yes. It's All the elements are initialized to zero. Yeah. In this language in C++, you have no idea what it's initialized to. I keep saying that just because, you know, a fair number of these students are C++. That is true. <clears throat> and, and if it's a reference type, meaning it's a class type, it's going to, going to go to null. So that is true. All right, that's the entire quiz. Let me look at the last version of the quiz and see if I'm expecting any additional answers to come up.
isn't in the quizzes that's going to be on the exam is I give you UML, you write a class that implements it, and show how to create an object of that type. <clears throat> may not even ask this part. So, it's not going to be hard stuff. I'm not going to give you something like with seven different instance members and 20, you know, functions and stuff like that. So, you know, if I give you a name of the class and we're going to call this one, you know, um, block. You've probably already done block before. And then I put some things in here, you know, like an X and a Y and a Z. And then down in the methods, I ask for a constructor. So it's going to have the name block, and it's going to take X, Y, and Z. And also I want one more. Get volume, which doesn't take anything, but returns an int. And then I say add a getter and setter for the X variable. You ought to be able to write a class that matches that. It really shouldn't take like more than five minutes to get that. We can do one right here. What's the keyword that starts the class? Whoops. I started to give it away. What's the keyword for starting a class? Class. Class. Yep. And the name of the class is? All right, I have some instance variables. They have plus signs in front of them, so I'm a bad programmer. No, I'm kidding. What does that plus sign mean? Do I make them static? No, they're instance variables, and I don't mention anything else. And like I said, I don't even remember how to mention or specify static. I think they're italics. Okay, so static int. Or not. Public int x. You could list all three of them separately, or you could put them all on the same line. I don't care which way you do it. Now we need a constructor. What's the keyword for that? Uh, excuse me, what is its uh, access level? Public. Public, and then does it have a return type? No. No. But it needs to take some parameters. This would be a syntax error, unfortunately. Kind of wish you could do that, but. And then what's that reasonably going to be expected to do even if I didn't say what the constructor was going this to do. Dot X yeah, it's going to set the values of the instance variables, right? So this dot x equals x, etc. Don't put etc, etc in your answer. <laughs> All right. And then we need a get volume, which is an int. So it's return type. Well, it's uh, access is public. Its return type is int. It's called get volume. And what are we going to do? Somebody read this out. Read them. Let me make it up this time. Int time volume. Get yeah. Int volume equals is this dot x times this dot y times this dot z. Yep. Or you could just do x dot you know, x times y times z, but I prefer you to use the this variable all the time. Excuse me, the this reference. And then you got to return that. All right, then the last thing, add a getter and a setter. What should the uh, return type of a setter be? Does it need to return anything? No. Nah, so we're going to declare this void. Does it need a parameter to accept an argument? Yes. It, it yeah, is. otherwise, what are you setting it to? And yeah, I would probably put that on the next line. So, what's the return type of the getter for x? Return this dot x. It would be a int. Yeah, since x is an int, does it need any arguments? No. No, because we're not changing its value, we're returning it. 
Now, am I going to ask you to do the block? No, it's going to be different, but same idea. Are we done? Yeah, we're done, unless I give you a second question, which is write a line, or write two lines of code that creates a block and sets and calls get volume. Right. Okay, so what's the type of the thing? It's a block. I'll probably give you a variable name, but if I didn't, D. What's the syntax here? Block B equals, uh, new block equals new block, and then what arguments am I going to pass it? Well, I didn't specify any. Make a buff, or maybe I'll tell you what to pass in. And now we're going to call get volume. So, what kind of variable would hold the volume? It would be the get volume. Yeah, so get volume is declared yeah, as get. an int. So, int result or int volume or something is equal to, and how do I get the volume out of that guy? The syntax for that, what's our object name? This dot x, it's, it's get volume. B. B dot. Yep, b dot get volume. Get Vigley, get volume. All right, then we're done. <laughs> and if I said print it out, you could put a print, but I try not to fluff it out too much. Okay. So, be able to do that. It'd be a fair question for me to give you a class and then ask you to create a UML, but I'm not going to do that. That gives away too much syntax of the class, right? Okay. Is this Our, open? Everything? Open book, open uh, okay. PowerPoints, open your prior programs, open anything open uploaded courses. to D2L. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, that folder, that uh, Dropbox that I say for your own purposes, you can upload anything you want to in there. Any other questions? Does it look easy? Hopefully it does if you've taken all the quizzes. The vast majority of them are either from the quizzes or rewording of the quizzes or use the same concepts from the quizzes. <clears throat> and I vote we end the class unless anybody is, really has a hankering for me to keep losing my voice while we lecture. End the class. We're going to end the class. Executive decision. <laughs> I'm not going to save these notes, though. You can watch the video if you need them. I hope but I started we the video. To, oh, we're going to Brown Jack. You had to do this Monday. Let's yeah, let's change that.